from Bernard Sabella. <clears throat> the quote is, this issue is not religious, it is political. The solution will be political, but to get there, we must activate the core beliefs of all religions. And my question would be to each of these gentlemen, what have you learned about activating your core beliefs to engage this issue? And I'm going to start with Mark. This, this issue of my faith, talking about my faith, is actually part of the problem. Because when we get into talking about my faith, that leads to, to religious triumphalism, that leads directly to nationalism, based on religion, or founded in religion, or religion is used for that. It morphs into that, and that separates us rather than unites us. It can confuse us with respect to what our faith traditions are meant to do. And for that, I will quote uh, you know, one of the, the Jewish prophets, Micah. We know the quote very well. What does God expect from us? To do justice, to love compassion, or maybe it's to love compassion and to, and to do justice, and to walk humbly with God. How do our faith traditions have the potential to join us together? So my Jewish upbringing was really completely colored and determined by these, the two stunning uh, events that happened in the mid-20th century, the Nazi Holocaust and the establishment of the State of Israel. It was as if, for me, that Naim, you were raised as a Christian in 12th century Europe, and part of your liturgy had to do with praising the conquest of Jerusalem and alongside of reading from the Gospels and from the letters of Paul and reciting creeds, you would sing songs and hymns and praise for the great warriors who had conquered Jerusalem, if that was part of your religion. Or Jamal, if you had been born in uh, the, uh, the Maghreb or Andalus in the 8th century, and part of uh, your tradition was not only reading the Quran, but praising the exploits and the military exploits of the caliphs of the Umayyads who had conquered most of the known world. It would have been like that, and that's what it was like for me. Um, as a Jew born in the United States in, the, in 1948, I was raised in a combination of rabbinic Judaism and political Zionism, and you could not pull them apart. They were all part of the same thing. We prayed three times a day uh, to the state of Israel, not Zion, not Jerusalem, the state of Israel, the first flowering of our redemption. The Israeli flag is on the pulpit. Um, Zionist songs and anthems, including military songs and anthems and Israeli folk songs, were right alongside of the medieval liturgy and the reading of Psalms. Um, and right next to Bible study was, this, was the history of the state of Israel. Uh, so. Now, at the same time, I was, was I taught the humanistic values of Judaism? Of course I was. We had the Ten Commandments, we had the prophets, we had the medieval rabbis. I was raised on Abraham Joshua Heschel, who talked about the Sabbath being a palace in time where we imitate God and complete the work of creation. There's Jewish mysticism there. Ethical monotheism was what I was brought up in, and it's very strong. But all of this, there was the drumbeat and the shadow of the Holocaust. And how many of you have been to a Passover Seder where we say, in every age, a tyrant rises up to oppress us, and the Lord God stretches out his hand and saves us? That's in our DNA. That's Jewish history. And it's very, very deeply embedded alongside of everything else. Uh, so, you know, you could say that Sinai was what I was raised on, but the book of Joshua was just as much an important part of that. And um, I think we see the evidence of that today in what's happening with the state of Israel. Now I say this with sadness, not to be dramatic. Why should we, the Jewish people, be any different than anybody else? We sin, we go astray, we forget about what God wants from us. We have to look in the mirror, we have to listen to our modern prophets telling us that we have to reform and we have to repent. Mark Ellis, the uh, Jewish theologian at Baylor University, talks about Constantinian religion versus community-based religion, and which one are you going to be? So obviously it cuts across all of the faith traditions. I understand that there's a controversy going on in Islam right now, modern Islam scholars looking at the caliphs 
and how they talked about God and that they were not so much the, um, they were the messengers of God rather than the representatives of his messenger and how that is playing out in modern Islam in terms of how it, it, it's being expressed in nationalism and that that's a problem. Um, I'm going to talk a lot this weekend about what's happened with Christianity uh, and how it has embraced uh, Zionism and political Zionism and in fact a kind of Jewish triumphalism in its attempt to reconcile with the Jewish people. So we're no longer the darkness, we are the light. The Abrahamic covenant with the real estate deal that goes with it is firmly in place and in force. And then Christianity hitches a ride on that. So instead of reconciling with the Jewish people, instead of really atoning for anti-Semitism, which is what Christianity properly needed to do, it's elevated Jewish triumphalism and reinforced Christian triumphalism at the same time. So, you know, we're all struggling with this. And we are all going to either fix it together or separ be separated and go down together. So where does this go? And I'll end with this. Um, I think we have to celebrate the diversity of our customs and our traditions. But if we are going to really follow Micah and really follow Jesus, um, we have to focus on breaking down the divisions and the distinctions between our faith traditions. We have to decide whether we're for Constantine or whether we're for community. We have to decide whether we are for tribalism or for universalism. Uh, I think what happened in the first century between Judaism and Christianity, or the, the folks who went on to become Christians, is exactly about that. I think the Jews made the wrong decision and stayed with the deal that they had and the client government in Jerusalem, which was the servants of Rome. Christians went off to try something new. We know what happened to that in the fourth century, and we're all still struggling to recover from that. The crisis of what's happening in the Holy Land today forces us to confront these things. Now, um, I want to be very clear about what I mean, and I'll close with this, when I talk about bringing us all together. Interfaith dialogue today has come to mean something very different than what I'm talking about. And I think you know what I mean. Um, in terms of talking about Israel and Palestine, the rules for interfaith dialogue are that you don't talk about Israel and Palestine. Yeah? Um, and the rules for Christians has been, um, if you want to do something about it and you want to work for justice in Palestine, you really can't go forward unless you have the permission and the agreement of the Jewish community. So. I hope that by the end of the weekend, we, I've cleared that up for you. Uh, how did I get here? And I really will close with this, Bishop. It was my confrontation with the occupation. You know, I grew up as a Zionist. I bought the Zionist narrative. I took that in as part of my religion and who I was. And then I saw the occupation. And I learned that my story was the Nakba. My story was the ethnic cleansing of Palestine that began in 1948 and continues to this day as we sit here. Now, it is not Naim's Nakba. It is not the story of the Palestinians. It's the Jewish story of the Nakba. They are different, but they are equally as compelling, and they are equally, they equally drive us, as certainly it has done for Naim, to construct a theology and Christians have to do this, too. That will tell us exactly what we need to do. Um, I think it's ironic that the path to this discovery, the path to this 21st century Jew, finally and truly discovering what his Judaism is about, had a guide. And the guide is this fellow sitting to my right a Palestinian Anglican priest. That's interfaith dialogue. So the quote is, again, just to, the issue is not religious, it is political. The solution will be political. But to get there, we must activate the core beliefs of all religions. And how do you activate your core belief to engage this issue? Jamal, what you? My friends, first of all, as a Muslim, what an honor it is to be here in this beautiful house of worship, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, would say, it did say, that every place of worship is simply a place consecrated to God. I'm also very honored to be with my cousins here, 
Same Abrahamic family, but of course a very dysfunctional family. <laughs> you know, Islam literally means surrender in peace. But what are you surrendering? One is surrendering one's attachment to one's ego, called the nafs in the Quran. So as the Quran says, you can bring a heart turned in devotion to God. That's the meaning of Islam. Some of you know I work very closely with a rabbi named Ted Falcon and a Christian pastor named Don McKenzie. Uh, we become very good friends. We tour the country. Uh, in fact, we talk about very hard issues. We talk about the untruths, chosen people, Jesus being the only way, Quran being superior to the other books. We name it, not to criticize, but to say it reflects our shadow side. We have to bring a higher light to shine on it. We don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. But what, what I wanted to convey to you is as since 9-11, we have been meeting regularly, me and my cousins, working together, collaborating. I soon realized that Rabbi Ted Falcon and Pastor Don McKenzie are two of the best Muslims I know. Because that's what a Muslim really means. To give up the attachment to the lower will in place of a higher will. So there's a lot of hope there in that association. The core teaching of Islam, of course there are many, but as we go around speaking, we say it is about if we ferret out all the verses of the Quran, the key teaching is about compassion. Prophet Muhammad once said, all that is in the holy books is in the Quran. All that is in the Quran is in the Surah Fatiha, first chapter. All that is in the Surah Fatiha is in the Basmallah which is about compassion. And Prophet Muhammad explained what, what this means is the greatest quality to cultivate on this mysterious journey called life is to be compassionate with yourself and to be compassionate with others. There's a very beautiful verse in the Quran which says when there are difficulties, when there's a lot of hatred, bitterness, helplessness, the Quran says it's not that the eyes have become blind, the hearts have become blind. When the hearts become blind, if you use force, as we have seen, only clenches the heart. Reason works, but it only goes so far. And here is our blessing and our challenge. Only that which comes from the heart can open another heart. What that means, that is the largest question. The third part I wanted to make very quickly, there's an abundance of verses in the Quran, some awkward verses notwithstanding, an overabundance of verses in the Quran that really espouse diversity. The Quran says if Allah wanted, Allah could have made all of us one single community. But Allah created diversity Gave each community a law and a way of life, different religions, books, prophets, colors, languages, men, women, nations, and tribes, all for one reason, that you might get to know the other. In modern, in modern verbiage, so you might really practice the three cups of tea. Listen, respect, connect. Simple but not easy. I could say many things, but I, I want to end with, as Muslims always do with a story, at least in the mystical tradition, which really summarizes our condition today. The mullah, who is the archetype of the main person for a teaching, he goes to work, opens his lunch pail box, what does he find? A cheese sandwich. Second day, third day, fourth day, it's always a lousy cheese sandwich. Tenth day, I'm getting sick and tired of this lousy cheese sandwich. His puzzle co-worker said, Mullah, why don't you ask your wife to make you another kind of sandwich? Be persuasive. He said, I'm not married. Who makes them? I do. <laughs> That's our story.
from my perspective, the only way I could approach the conflict is from my uh, faith perspective. I've never belonged to any political party. Um, I've never uh, felt that um, I need to be uh, within a political party and have to speak through that party line. I was brought up in a Christian family. Uh, my father was a lay person. Um, he was not a minister or a priest, but he was very religious. Um, I remember as a little boy when the Zionist came to my hometown and um, occupied it and a few days later gave us two hours and threw us out. We could not stay in our home or in our hometown. Um, I remember that impacted me as a little boy and we were evicted from our town. Uh, that really affected my life, but we moved to Nazareth and I was brought up in Nazareth in a very religious uh, home uh, with strong faith in Jesus Christ. That's part of my background. I was taught from childhood that God is a God of love, but also a God of justice. And so when I reflected on my own experience in my town, how we were driven out, I knew that there was something wrong. It was an injustice that threw us out. Uh, and that uh, the Zionism that came to us um, was, was wrong, was unjust. Um, so that's really the approach that I've always had, coming out to this conflict from my position of faith. Unfortunately, I've also felt that as religions, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, we have really failed to find a resolution to the conflict. That the conflict truly, as Bernard Sabella said, did not start as a religious conflict. It started as a political conflict. Um, the Zionists wanted to come and take Palestine. Um, it had nothing to do with religion because all the early Zionists were not religious. Uh, some were secular, um, some were atheists. So it, they were not motivated by religious zeal. Unfortunately, today, the strongest expression of Zionism is a religious Zionism. And so, although Zionism did not start um, in any way religious, now we have to contend with, uh, with the settlers who are religious and who want to take more and more of Palestine and drive the Palestinians out. So my, I approach this conflict from my core belief in a God of love, but also a God of justice, a God of compassion, God of mercy. And I really believe that we have failed because we have not really been able as a religious people to find a resolution to the conflict. Um, and that's why today, if I'm approaching it from a position of faith, I would say the only way forward is to share the land. And when a segment of the uh, people who are now dominating and who are occupying, which is the government of Israel, when they are saying, no, we want all the land and we want to drive out the Palestinians, I believe they're not true to their own faith. And I believe that they are committing an injustice to their own people and to their own religion. Because as people of faith, I believe that we can say, we believe in one God, and this God brings us together, should bring us together, and that God, this God calls us to work for peace, because God is also 
the God of peace. And we believe in the God of peace and the God of justice. And that's why today, uh, those of us who are committed to religious faith and to a faith-based approach to this must find a theology uh, that can help us find a resolution to the conflict. And that's why I hope in this conference we will find ways to connect with each other and also to work together so that the occupation will end and that we and all the people who live, whether they are people of faith, Muslims, Jews or Christians, or secular people that we can find ways to live together in peace and respect each other and accept each other in the different faiths that we belong to. It is possible to resolve this conflict, yes, and it is possible to be inspired by our religious faith, whether from Islam or from Judaism or from Christianity. We can be inspired to find resolutions to this conflict, and this is what I am committed to, and I am sure all of us are committed to here, and I hope that we will be able to work together to find a resolution of this intractable, seemingly intractable conflict so that we can live together in peace and then beyond peace find reconciliation um, among uh, all the people and for all the people of the land. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, Mark Twain <clears throat> once uh, said that he that many people are bothered by parts of Scripture that they don't understand. That he was far more bothered by the parts of Scripture he did understand. And so I'm going to ask you, from <clears throat> your faith perspective, is there one bit of Scripture or Holy Writ that you would say drives you on this issue? And anybody can. Pick up the mic and start on this. A story that uh, uh, what I go by is uh, thinking about things that I remember from my childhood, moments that stick in my mind. Because how many things have you forgotten from your childhood? So the things that you remember, they're there for a reason. Um, so when I think about my religious upbringing, I think about one story that I was told. There was a guy named uh, I.L. Peretz. He, was, he lived in Europe and he, told, he wrote in Yiddish. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, he was very much in the rabbinic sort of Hasidic tradition. And uh, there's a story of a great rabbi in one of the great European cities. And uh, he, was, uh, he was troubled by a, uh, a troublemaker who used to come around and ask him hard questions to try to stump the rabbi and get him to, you know. He was very irreverent. So one day he comes to the rabbi and he said, um, Rabbi, I want you to teach me the whole Torah while I'm standing on one foot. And the rabbi uh, didn't miss a beat. He looked at him and he said, okay, you know, stand on one foot. I'm standing on one foot, he said, do not do unto others what you would not have them do unto you. That's the whole Torah. The rest is commentary. Get out of here. Amen. <laughs> I think one of the most important verses that um, I remember continuously and drives me and inspires me is when Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. So I've always felt that um, this is not only a commandment, but it's a great challenge. Um, and that if I really wanted to claim uh, that I am I belong to God or disciple of Christ or a child of God in the way we Christians express this. I must be about peacemaking. 
Now, it so happens that um, uh, peacemaking for me is a commitment to work within the Palestinian-Israeli uh, situation, because that's, that's where I find myself. But I would say that it applies to all of us wherever we are, that peacemaking is at the heart of every one of us uh, call to life. Um, and I believe um, to be engaged in peacemaking, and here I emphasize the word making, because there, always, there are people that are peacekeepers. Uh, but for us, peace is something that you can make. You can be involved in it. You can, be, you can make it. You can work at it, at establishing that kind of peace. And that's why I feel we cannot sit back and do nothing and just wish for peace. We must really be actively engaged in peacemaking. And that's why the words of Jesus Christ for me has always uh, challenged me and inspired me to really continue to work for uh, peace for all the people of the land, everyone, for the Muslims, for the Jews, for the Christians. And that continues to inspire me today. Thank you. I'll be very brief. I just want to, through a story, tell a brief story about the problem with our religions. We get so focused on, shall I, shall I say, the metaphor of the glass and the water. We polish the glass, but we do nothing about the water, uh, which is about institution of the religion and the message of the religion. And our work really is, as religious leaders, those are religious leaders, to bring us back to the essence of our faith. For example, the Quran says, repel evil with something which is better, so that he with whom you have enmity becomes as though he was a bosom friend. Very beautiful, but very inconvenient. <laughs> The story is God, you know, uh, in the Abrahamic faith, same story, God comes down and reveals certain basic truths to some people. But then the devil comes along and says, let me organize that for you. <laughs> and that becomes religion. Thank you. <clears throat> Holy God, the source of creation, ever present in the changes of the world, be present with your people gathered here who come seeking justice and peace. Empower us with vision and courage to enable the peoples of this earth to acquire the skills and resources necessary for a growing and complex world. Enable those from countries with plenty to share their lives, riches, and resources with those in need. Embolden those with vision to proclaim new ways of creating communities of responsibility, justice, and peace. Engage us in learning from one another and in valuing the unique gifts that you have given to the people of every land and faith. 